Good evening, all. Uh, thanks for waiting for a long time, but uh, this is the most interesting topic, I guess. Uh, um, let's focus on the uh, next topic, uh, which is exploring deep learning framework using Py PyTorch by Stephanie Kim. Please inter uh, welcome her with the applause. Great. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about me and where I work before we get into the talk. Uh, so I am a developer, but I also do data science work focusing on natural language processing for the most part. Uh, I love to help people build better products by learning what users are thinking and trying to understand how they're feeling using machine learning and text analysis. Uh, I also spend my time increasing my own knowledge and educating others about racial bias in AI, um, specifically facial recognition software. So if you have interest in any of those topics or PyTorch, um, definitely come find me and I'll, um, I'd love to talk about them. So I also, in 2012, I think, I founded Seattle Pi Ladies, um, and I'm a developer advocate at Algorithmia. So I know Pi Ladies has a booth here, um, so definitely stop by, buy some t-shirts, support the group. Um, we'd love to see you. So a little bit about the people that pay the bills. Uh, so at Algorithmia, we believe that every application will eventually become an intelligent application. But um, as my boss says, TensorFlow is open source. Uh, scaling, it's not. Same with PyTorch. Uh, if any of you have trained a neural net or a machine learning model, then you know that um, that's only part of it. You also have to productionize that model, and that's a whole other skill set. So we really focus on the scaling of machine and deep learning models and are the cloud agnostic DevOps for data science. So if you have any questions about that, uh, let me know. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to share a promo code. So if you want to sign up, uh, try to deploy your open, um, your <coughs> TensorFlow or your PyTorch or CNTK model. Uh, you can do so, and you can kick the tires of the platform. Um, also, ask me anything. Uh, that's all my stuff there. Uh, my email is super easy to remember. Um, and so just, you know, on Twitter, um, LinkedIn, email, ask me anything. Okay, so now we're going to go to the talk. So this talk will objectively look at PyTorch and why it might be the best fit for your deep learning use case. And we'll look at use cases that will show why you might actually want to consider TensorFlow instead. Um, of course, there are a lot of other deep learning frameworks out there, but I'll focus on these two for sake of brevity. So we're going to go through uh, the basics of what tensors are and computational graphs. Um, we're going to talk about the dynamic computational graphs that make PyTorch what it is, and, and then why they're so cool. And I'll go through some um, reasons why debugging in PyTorch is really, really awesome. And then I'll talk about serialization of models, which uh, isn't my favorite thing about PyTorch. Um, and then, of course, I'll talk about use cases where, you know, you really might want to use one versus the other, depending upon uh, what your project is. So it's a fairly objective look at, at PyTorch, but also throwing some TensorFlow information there, too. So PyTorch is a Python, or, uh, you know, obviously, open source deep learning framework that was primarily developed by Facebook's Artificial Intelligence uh, Research Group, and it was publicly introduced in January of 2017, so it's really new, right? Um, it's only been around for almost a year and a half. So while it is still really new, uh, users are rapidly adopting uh, to it because it's very modular, it uh, supports dynamic computation graphs, and um, while it's not the only uh, framework out there that does that, it's the one that has um, uh, done it the, the best so far. And it, the dynamic computational graphs allow you to change how the network behaves on the fly, unlike static graphs, uh, which you know, TensorFlow uses. So PyTorch offers that modularity, the dynamic graphs, and it, um, Using those dynamic graphs, it really enhances the ability to debug or see within the network. And for many, um, its API is more intuitive to learn than TensorFlow's. So PyTorch shares some C++ backend uh, with the deep learning framework Torch, hence the name PyTorch. Uh, and Torch was written in Lua. Uh, now PyTorch simply isn't um, a Python interface like on top of Torch. Um, 
it's actually, it was completely rewritten and it's deeply integrated um, in the underlying C++ code and it shares similar performance to Torch. Um, but of course it's Python, so it's in a language that has made for a wider scale adoption because um, not many people know Lua. It's, it's just de definitely not as uh, widespread as Python. So the community around PyTorch has really taken off in the short year that's been publicly available and it's been cited in various research papers and groups. The image shown um, is from a popular image filter model that was originally written in Torch and developed by Jen Wansu and Tsetsung Park and they rewrote it in PyTorch and they cited the same or sometimes better uh, performance results as the Torch version, so that's pretty cool. So PyTorch, again, is really gaining traction in the community, not just the research community, but um, other you know, developers or data scientists are starting to play around with it. Um, and it's really the go-to deep learning framework for quickly iterating on models and for making tight deadlines. And that's you know, pretty much to its, due to its intuitive, imperative programming architecture. It's got a really friendly API. The framework is also extensible using scikit-learn and other common Python libraries. And you can even extend um, some PyTorch's main components like Torch NN and Torch Autograd. And you can even write custom C extensions. So it's easy to ramp up and get started as a beginner, especially when you're already familiar with NumPy. Um, and get this, you can even run NumPy like arrays on GPUs, which is pretty neat. Another unique aspect of PyTorch um, is that it does rely on those dynamic computational graphs. That means graphs are created on the fly, which you might want if you have variable um, non-uniform input lengths or dimensions. And those dynamic graphs make debugging as easy as debugging in Python. But maybe you're saying, I don't even know what these you know, computational graphs are, let alone tensors. So um, if you do, I, you know, I said that I'm gonna go through what tensors are and computational graphs. If you know all that, you can just go heads down on your phone, play a game or something. Um, for the next couple minutes. So, um, because I'm an amazing artist, I drew this lovely diagram for you of tensors on my whiteboard at home. It's a little dark, sorry about that. Um, evidently, I'm no photographer either. So, uh, deep learning frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow, and wait, I know the name is a spoiler alert alone, um, use tensors as their data structure. So tensors are the main building blocks of deep learning frameworks, uh, of course, besides the computational graphs, variables, et cetera. Um, and they're basically objects describing a linear uh, relationship to other objects. So these data containers can be various sizes, as you can see on the slide. Um, a 1D tensor is a vector, a 2D tensor is a matrix, 3D tensor is a cube, and so on, and they hold numerical values. So if you've worked with NumPy, then it's easy to make the mental switch to tensors. Uh, and you can even think of tensors as ND arrays or multi-dimensional arrays if, if you want to think about it like that. So it's not, um, tensors aren't intimidating or anything. We already have played around with, with uh, usually NumPy arrays by this time. So we need to talk about computational graphs next because it's a huge difference between uh, PyTorch and other deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow um, is how they architect graphs. So obviously I didn't make this because it looks really good. Um, so deep learning frameworks all require computational graphs and computational graphs state the order of computations that are supposed to occur, right? So computational graphs are just DAX. They're directed ASIC graphs. So they're directional and they have nodes, uh, which you can see, which make up uh, variables such as tensors, uh, while the edges make up operations such as multiplication or addition, um, and those operations um, are performed on the tensors. So on the slide you can see that the nodes hold variables and each computation makes up a new tensor. Right, so neural nets rely on computational graphs, and when the network is being trained, the gradients of the loss function get computed off of the weights and biases, then the weights are updated using gradient descent. This is done efficiently by the computational graph using the chain rule. So dynamic computational graphs are kind of the cool kids of computational graphs. So PyTorch relies on dynamic computational graphs which are built at runtime um, on the fly versus TensorFlow which relies on static graphs and, um, and then they are created at compile time. <laughs> 
So this means that everything has to be defined in TensorFlow before it's run, uh, which means if you want to make any changes to the neural net structure, you have to rebuild it from scratch every, every single time you want to make a change. So what does it really mean to be dynamic? So for each iteration in an epic, and then you guys are just like probably eyes glazed over at this point, right? So there's a lot of uh, vocabulary that you kind of have to learn when uh, learning neural nets and, and deep learning frameworks. So um, in PyTorch, one epic in neural nets uh, means that there's one forward pass and one backward pass of all the training examples in your data set, right? So for each iteration, there's a forward pass and a backward pass of the batch size of inputs, right? So for each iteration in an epic, a computational graph is created um, in PyTorch. So after each iteration, the graph is uh, freed in PyTorch, which is great, yay, more memory available. So it being a define by run framework, uh, defining the graph in the forward pass uh, versus define then run framework in TensorFlow, means that your back prop is actually defined um, by how your code is run and that every single iteration can be different. And that's kind of neat. Um, it's, so it's really customizable, right? Uh, PyTorch records the values as they happen in your code to build the dynamic graph as the code is run. Um, and you can see that in, in the, uh, the git there. So PyTorch does this through reverse automatic differentiation system. And that's, uh, they call it autograd which um, is used to calculate the gradients. So reverse automatic differentiation is simply walking backwards through the computational graph to calculate the derivatives. So here is a small toy example of using autograd. Uh, remember that during the forward pass of the network is where we'll define the computational graph, uh, where the nodes in the graph are tensors and edges will be computations um, that create the output, right? and both the input and output are tensors. Then we can back prop through the graph to compute the gradients. So on the slide, you'll see that the variable A is a tensor. Uh, do note that variable um, is deprecated and you don't need to use it to use autograd anymore. Um, my version on my laptop is a little bit older, so I just wanted to make a little note of that. So variable A is a tensor, and you pass in requires underscore grad equals true, so you can later get the gradient of that tensor. Down at the bottom, you'll see um, we have backward, which will use autograd to compute the backward pass in our little example. That will compute the loss on any tensors uh, with the um, requires underscore grad true. So to reiterate how PyTorch does reverse automatic differentiation is that the graph is created on the fly each time code is encountered and with backprop, the graph will be dynamically walked backward recalculating the gradient when you need it. Okay, so we understand what tensors are, computational graphs, and even dynamic graphs now, but what makes them so cool? So because operations in PyTorch actually modify real data versus um, in TensorFlow, um, no, in TensorFlow, they're actually just references or containers where data will be inserted later. Um, PyTorch, um, since it does uh, have real data, it's possible to debug your code within the graph itself and treat it like regular Python code meaning due to that programming architecture, you can set breakpoints, print out values during uh, computation. You can read the stack trace and know what part of the code it's actually referring to. With TensorFlow, you have to rely on a lot of external tools, um, including TensorFlow board, to see what went wrong where. And that's a lot more limited about what you can print out. You can only print out from your session, not within uh, the graph itself. So dynamic computational graphs also are cool because they have varying input links. Um, they allow for varying uh, variable input links, which is important when you don't know exactly how much memory to allocate to your inputs. Um, for instance, like in natural language processing, sentence links will vary. Um, if you were to create a sentiment analysis model using recurrent neural nets, for example, um, where you would have the various input sizes um, and you need native uh, control flow logic, it's a lot easier with dynamic computational graphs uh, than it is static. So if you were trying to do that with TensorFlow, um, you would have to pad the inputs with zeros uh, to, and then set a maximum length of your sentences um, to allow for any variable input lengths, unless you use TensorFlow Fold, and that does allow for um, dynamic batching. So, um, and again, this is 
um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is really due to the dynamic graph architecture versus static graph architecture. Um, because static graphs um, only allow for the same input size and shape because you know, they're defined before they're ran and you have to be very explicit about your inputs before you create um, that TensorFlow session to run your graph. Um, okay, so another great thing about PyTorch is you can add custom logic easily within the graph itself. Uh, using native Python rather than when you want to write operations. Uh, when building the graph in TensorFlow, you have to use their control operators. So, I mean, it's not a huge deal, but it's just one of those little annoying things that you can't write native Python code in TensorFlow. Uh, but static graphs aren't all bad, right? Um, TensorFlow actually has a lot of really awesome features. So remember, static graph architecture can be thought of as define the graph, run the graph once to initialize the weights, then run your data through the graph multiple times within TensorFlow session for training. Uh, this architecture allows for distributed computing, so you can run the graph several times on different workers. This is because you define the graph before you run it, and so each node is independent from each other, and so computations can be run in parallel. So this allows for different computations to be run on CPUs while others can be run on GPUs. Um, but no, you can actually do that in PyTorch, um, which I'll show later. So static graphs also allow for easy optimization because you optimize the graph uh, while defining the graph before you actually run it and insert any data. So it's a lot harder for a dynamic graph to be optimized since it's being created as the code runs. Uh, now, static graph architecture uh, also allows for the graph to be saved with all its methods and fun functions for production, like predict. Um, I'll compare this uh, type of serialization with the way PyTorch does it a little bit later on. So recall that I said that PyTorch's methods actually hold real data, while TensorFlows are ref just references to data. Um, this is kind of easier to digest, in my opinion, with a little code example. So on the slide, uh, we're creating two tensors and adding them together. Super simple, right? It looks like NumPy, and the output is very easy to understand. Uh, you have a tensor of type float of size 3. Um, so the output's really digestible, too. So in TensorFlow, um, note you've got your variables, x underscore 1, x underscore 2, and um, they aren't actually holding real data. They're just symbolic tensor objects created with TF constant. Also notice that instead of using native Python to add like you could in PyTorch, uh, you have to use the TensorFlow API, TF add in this case. Um, note that you also, your output is, um, you're only getting a reference to the tensor. No data actually at this point has been injected yet until you uh, call a TF session. So I think this comparison leads us to understand a little bit more about why debugging in PyTorch would be so awesome. So due to the dynamic graphs in PyTorch, the tensors actually contain values, right? And those operations can modify real data. So this means that in PyTorch, you can use your favorite IDE to debug using regular Python. You can print out weight sizes or whatever you want from the tensor within the graph itself. Uh, you can add breakpoints or um, even step into the forward pass or the loss function. And uh, that's really cool when you're debugging. Uh, note, however, that for calculating the gradient, um, you have to use uh, the method, the PyTorch method, register underscore hook, um, to inspect gradients because that part of the computation is uh, carried out by PyTorch, not the user. So, um, but still, the fact that you could do it is really awesome. All this is huge because when training a neural net, you don't want to spend all that time, and honestly, you're spending money too, uh, training only to get error messages after you know, like, two days of training. That would be really sad. Um, and, since, and so in TensorFlow, debugging isn't so sweet. Uh, you can inspect the variables from your session, um, or there's the TensorFlow debugger tool you can use. But again, like everything in TensorFlow, you have to use, uh, or you have to learn their way of doing things, their API for every little thing, um, for what PyTorch makes super easy to do uh, natively in Python. Um, and, and again, their API is just easier to uh, use. Um, but you do have, in TensorFlow, the tensor board, which makes things um, easier to debug, and, and so there's a trade-off. Um, right now, th I think there's a, um, PyTorch doesn't have this built-in natively, any kind of visualization tool, but I'm pretty sure they're libraries. I haven't tried them out yet. All right, so because this is deep learning, let's talk about GPU support for PyTorch. 
um, in PyTorch, GPU utilization is pretty much in the hands of the developer in the sense that you must define uh, whether you're using CPUs or GPUs, uh, which you can see a quick example of on the slide. Um, basically, you're saying, hey, if I've got GPUs, uh, use them. If not, just rely on the CPU on the machine. Uh, a note on GPU utilization in TensorFlow before I continue about PyTorch. Um, is that while you can explicitly define whether you want to use CPUs or GPUs um, in TensorFlow, TensorFlow um, de uh, by default tries to figure it out for you. <clears throat> if GPUs are available, it will actually defer to using them and it will take up um, by default again all available GPU memory. So while training a lot of times you actually want this, you want all your GPUs to be used, um, however, TensorFlow, unless you are using their preloading package, um, will take up all available GPU memory for preloading and pre-caching data, and I'm sure that's not what you want to use your precious expensive GPUs for. So TensorFlow gives you a couple of ways around this. There are configurations shown in the docs um, that show you how to allocate memory as you need it, or a straight up limit how much um, of each device you want to allow TensorFlow to use, and I've even heard of people masking um, uh, the variable, environment variable to say, just don't even see how much GPU machine I have, GPU I have on my machine. So there's ways around it, but it's kind of one of those things that some people forget and uh, it can get you in trouble. So also note that TensorFlow session does not release the GPU even when you close the session. So you have to kill the process to release memory. Um, again, it's one of those things that um, people tend to forget about and they don't understand why it looks like their GPUs are being used um, when they're actually idle. So this is due to TensorFlow allocating memory to the lifetime of the process, not the, ses not the session, so you have to kill the Python process. Okay, so back to GPU support in PyTorch. On the slide is a quick example of how you can run NumPy-like uh, arrays on a GPU. So you could see how to specify what device you want um, with torch.device in the first line of code up there. Um, note that torch ones will automatically be created on CPU. So to change it to using GPUs, you can simply pass in the specific device you want uh, with a device keyword argument. So it's really, really super easy. Um, also, if you wanted to convert it from a tensor, like so um, torch.ones is just a tensor. Um, it's basically just a vector. Uh, to, if you want to um, convert that to a NumPy array, you can simply uh, apply the num uh, method NumPy to your Torch One's tensor. It's that easy. Um, this is cool because say you want to do some computational heavy data pre-processing and you're in NumPy but you want to switch to using GPUs in PyTorch uh, and then you want to switch back to NumPy arrays when you're done, it's really super easy. So another cool part about PyTorch and GPU utilization is that you can move everything from the content tree, including tensors, gradient position, and weights. So basically every component um, in the network, and it can be transferred back and forth from CPU to GPU. Uh, you can see on the slide how easy it is to transfer a tensor from CPU to GPU in the uh, forward function. Um, it's not hard at all, right? So there are some benefits uh, to this kind of flexibility. Uh, so for custom complex architectures, some work should be done on the CPU and some should be done on the GPU, right? And um, being able to optimize is really cool. Uh, also, being able to clone and save your model state in host memory during training allows for easy checkpointing of your tra um, uh, if your training deviates. Also, you get to define how your model is parallelized, so that's neat too. I do want to uh, make the point, though, that CUDA copies can be really costly, so be careful where you're taking advantage of this feature. Uh, also note that GPU operations are asynchronous, so when you're moving stuff around, um, you want to use Torch uh, CUDA Synchronize to wait for all the kernels and streams to finish uh, running, otherwise it will be very slow to move things around if it's waiting for the model to finish running, so a little caveat there. So the nice uh, thing about GPU utilization in PyTorch is the easy and fairly automatic way of initializing data parallelism. Using 
uh, tor torch.nn.data uh, parallel, which you can see defined in the fourth line of code within the init method there. Uh, you can wrap, you can use that to wrap around a module to parallelize over multiple GPUs in the bash dimension. Uh, this occurs without, as you can see, without a ton of work on your part, while TensorFlow, it's more of a manual process. I'm sure you've kind of heard a theme, everything in TensorFlow is a little bit more manual. Um, you have to get your hands dirty a, a lot with, uh, a lot more with TensorFlow. So you also, in both TensorFlow and PyTorch, I just want to um, make sure and let you all know about the preloaders that are available um, that allow you to preload the data using multiple workers for parallel processing. Um, and again, that should be used for stuff like loading your data. You don't want to swamp your expensive GPUs um, with just loading data. So, And um, the last three code examples were just taken from PyTorch docs, so definitely um, you can get all the nitty-gritty information um, the PyTorch, doc, PyTorch docs are really well written, in my opinion, and it's, um, again, their API is just super smooth, too. Except I'm not a huge fan of serialization um, in PyTorch. It's a little bit tricky depending upon your use case. Um, I, I've read a lot about everybody saying, oh, it's so easy in both frameworks. And I'm like, oh, have you put those into production? Um, because they're not equal. So in the first and recommended way, as you can see on the slide, the model parameters or weights um, are saved in a dictionary, um, then serialized, saving it to disk, right? That binary can be then read by uh, load underscore state underscore dict, and then the weights you get in an ordered dict can uh, be then used to inject back into the network. So this means that the serialization process is completely ignorant of your model structure. The second way, um, as you could see right there, is pickling the entire model, um, and that's more for the use case of when you want to resume training later on. So you stop training, um, you pickle your model, and then you want to resume it later on. This uh, way you save your model with, and I do want to say don't ever call it eval on it if you want to resume training later on. Um, so uh, when you, when you do this note, uh, and I don't think it says this in the docs, you actually have to explicitly save the epic state and the optimizer of your graph uh, to get back to training. Um, but uh, this way actually doesn't get you the whole way in, in terms of saving your entire model structure. It's still ignorant of some um, artifacts. So to understand what this means, let's talk about how TensorFlow saves a model. So with TensorFlow, you can save the entire computational graph as a protocol buffer that saves operations and weights, everything you need to use it for inference, um, like predict, hello, without needing to deploy your actual source code that exported, um, uh, with, uh, exported the protocol buffer file. So this makes it really easy to deploy in other languages, um, such as Java, because not everybody uses Python for production. Sometimes you have different teams using different languages. Um, and it also makes for backward compatibility um, a lot easier. So Porch, uh, PyTorch's serialization methods assume that you have the entire source code at your disposal um, when you're deploying your model to production, and, um, and you won't have access to uh, operations so the problems with this is that you might not actually have that original source code. Um, and you also might want to deploy your model in a different language. So PyTorch's methods for serialization and deserialization makes backwards compatibility an issue in production. You have to be very careful about making any changes to your model because if you don't have that original source code, um, you could have mismatched model parameters with your new model. So it's um, it's a part that I'm not the biggest fan on with PyTorch. But there's solutions, which is great. Um, so you might want to try out um, Onk's Open Neural Network Exchange, uh, which is a library that focuses on taking research code into production. It was developed by uh, Facebook uh, with an open, and it's, it, it's open source format. Um, and it makes it easier to work between different frameworks, um, such as if you're developing your model in PyTorch and deploying it in CAFE too. Um, Facebook has different teams working in PyTorch um, for research purposes, and other teams use CAFE 2 for deployment. Um, so it makes sense that 
a format was needed for interoperability between frameworks. Uh, it's the same issue we've had at Algorithmia. Um, we developed a solution to this as well because we needed a broader, more generic solution. Um, so if you run into some serialization issues yourself with uh, productionizing PyTorch, um, the GitHub has more of the docs and then um, it's available through pip install on PyPy. All right, so um, I've talked a lot about why PyTorch is really great, um, but also highlighted along the ways that make TensorFlow um, pretty great too. But, but now I'm gonna break it down um, by use case. So, cause we all kind of care more about like how it pertains to us. So one area that makes PyTorch a more favorable choice when creating deep learning models um, is its natural support of recurrent neural nets. Because uh, RNNs have variable inputs and due to PyTorch's use of dynamic graphs, RNNs actually run faster on PyTorch than on TensorFlow and you don't have to hack together a solution using TensorFlow Fold, um, just to use um, the dynamic graph structure. Also, again, due to the choice of having uh, the dynamic graphs versus static graphs, uh, PyTorch is, I hope I've made it obvious that it's a, easy, it's a winner for easy debugging and being able to quickly iterate on your model um, due to its um, imperative programming structure. Researchers have been the largest adopters and fangirls and boys of PyTorch because of this. But as I mentioned, um, Facebook, uh, uses PyTorch for research while well, they use CAFE2 for production. And um, at least right now, that's kind of where TensorFlow currently shines is production. So with TensorFlow serving and mobile support, TensorFlow is often the framework of choice. Um, there are a few reasons for this. Uh, when, I mean, obviously TensorFlow is backed by Google. They have got great marketing, um, but also it's, it's architecture, right? So TensorFlow is built for distributed computing. Uh, static graphs naturally allow for better optimization, while automatic differentiation has to be performed on every iteration of the graph in PyTorch, which can slow it down, but it's very dependent upon your use case. As I said, if you're um, using LSTMs, um, which is a form of recurrent neural net, um, then PyTorch is gonna be faster. And, uh, and honestly, LSTMs are used for a lot of um, uh, flexible use cases and they're really popular. So uh, if you fall into that category, definitely check out PyTorch. Um, but more importantly, um, the development of TensorFlow serving, so it's, a, it's um, a development engine specifically created for productionizing TensorFlow models. Um, uh, and TensorFlow has really focused on that. So it's the architecture and it's got, you know, Google to back it up, but it, they also develop TensorFlow serving. Um, currently, PyTorch doesn't have anything similar. So uh, TensorFlow serving is really helpful because it uses the gRPC open source framework and it runs on HTTP2 um, and uses protocol buffers uh, for default serialization. Again, a portion of the pipeline where in my opinion, uh, TensorFlow has a leg up. The reason why uh, using gRPC is great is because with it, the model can be deployed in Java or C++, for example, because unfortunately, well, maybe not unfortunately, um, not everyone uses Python for production. So TensorFlow serving um, is really useful because it takes care of a lot of the issues that you may have run into if you're not using it, if you're just trying to deploy your TensorFlow models without it, um, like, you know, exploding your Docker containers with your huge TensorFlow models um, when they get out of hand and suck up all your GPU. Um, or if you have multiple TensorFlow models um, with different TensorFlow versions. Um, so you definitely, like if you're productionizing TensorFlow, you're gonna run into problems too if you're not using TensorFlow serving. Um, but um, just a disclaimer, I actually haven't use TensorFlow serving um, because I just deploy TensorFlow models to Algorithmia and they take care of everything for me. Um, TensorFlow also kind of wins in the mobile support area because they have TensorFlow Lite and that's um, used for integration into Android and iOS. Um, I have not, that might be a summer project to do uh, tens to use TensorFlow Lite in Android, um, but um, from what I've read, the process, while it exists, it's not entirely pain-free, but um, I think I've made that clear that nothing in TensorFlow is pain-free. 
So um, if you are paying attention, I mentioned that PyTorch currently doesn't have much support for production, but I already um, mentioned the Onks uh, library, which helps with the compatibility across different frameworks. Um, unfortunately, many aren't supported right now. But luckily, on the roadmap for PyTorch is to combine uh, PyTorch with Cafe2 for deploying models into production without losing PyTorch's uh, iterability, ease of use, and awesome debugging. So I, I feel like they've really listened to the community and, and um, any complaints that they've heard about productionizing PyTorch. And, and so they're adding a ton of optimization features by expanding the API, such as adding the ability to configure memory layouts, which is huge, um, such as you know supporting either uh, NCHW uh, or NHWC, um, and so which layout you want um, depends on your hardware, so you can read up on that. Um, so in the near future, when they release PyTorch 1.0, they are releasing uh, Torch.jit, which is a just-in-time compiler that converts your PyTorch models into production-ready code. Um, that can also expect your, export your model into a C++ runtime. So note they're um, also planning on adding better mobile support as well. I don't know as much about that, but um, it, you know, if, if it's um, in, like anything else on their API, it's going to be user friendly. So I hope this talk has helped you understand areas where you might want to use PyTorch and where you might want to actually look at TensorFlow for your solution um, in your project. A lot of times you're um, choosing PyTorch for flexibility, um, uh, quickly getting ideas out there, um, prototyping, that sort of thing. That's why it's so heavily used by research. Um, sometimes you're losing out on performance, but that depends on a few things, like are you um, running recurrent neural nets or what's your hardware like? Um, so uh, be, again, being able to configure those different me memory layouts um, in the future the, um, it's making the future look really good for PyTorch and um, because they're really um, now focusing on performance and production. So if you still aren't sure and you have specific use cases where you want to understand support for something, um, say you want to look at like um, how many issues there are in multi, uh, multi G, multiple GPUs uh, in TensorFlow versus PyTorch, I'd say, you know, read the docs, do, um, read and blog posts, of course, but um, a lot of those are outdated and some of them are wrong. Um, so something fun, if you want a summer project, uh, you could do a little NLP project on GitHub issues for that subject in each framework. For instance, if you are looking at data parallelism, you can look at the volume of issues related to that, um, in the content, uh, the con you can look at the content of the text uh, of those issues, maybe the ratio of open to closed issues on multiple GPUs. So just kind of a fun idea for y'all this summer, maybe. Um, if you want to look on how to choose a framework, you can uh, do a little data science project. Maybe it'll be my summer project. Anyway, um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, there's that promo code I was uh, talking about to get half a million credits. Um, again, ask me anything about, um, you know, any of the projects I mentioned that I'm interested in, uh, especially um, uh, racial bias and facial recognition software, NLP projects, and of course, PyTorch. Um, thanks, and fielding questions. Questions. It doesn't even have to be related to PyTorch. If you don't have PyTorch questions, you can ask me something else. The uh, oh, there I am. Hi. Uh, related to the racial bias in uh, facial recognition. If you want to give us like a 60 second elevator speech for us to get started in that, um, I'd really appreciate that. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, it's a topic I'm super passionate about. So um, I specifically look at um, racial bias in facial rec recognition software, uh, mostly because uh, facial recognition software isn't just used to unlock phones and computers, it's used in police surveillance. Um, and facial recognition software, according to an FBI co-authored study um, with, per, I think, perpetuallineup.org, if my memory serves me, um, has found that um, facial recognition software fails 
uh, a lot more on uh, African Americans. And so that's a huge issue. Um, there's a, a whole a whole other um, issue within that um, that there's not any uh, regulation on how police use uh, the data in their uh, database. Some even have um, DMV images. Uh, some have mug shots, but there's no um, uh, no one's looking at model accuracy or anything. Uh, and and I look at Open Face uh, facial recognition software. It's an open uh, open source facial recognition software, I kind of take it apart and see where the different areas of racial bias can um, be, you know, integrated accidentally. Um, a lot of times through old outdated models um, and usually it has to do with the training data. But I just want to make it clear that when you, um, when you're looking at your model, model accuracy and you're not using a diverse uh, test set, if it's very similar to your training uh, set, your model accuracy is gonna look great. Um, but I want to note that most publicly available data sets for training are anywhere from 70 to 80% white male. So, um, and th these are, um, this is just kind of coming out that um, people are starting to look at the diversity of training sets. So um, people, like us that aren't, um, that don't have access to huge private data sets like Facebook and Google, um, we are very limited on what we can use. So my goal is to just raise awareness so hopefully um, researchers can get more money to uh, create and publicize more diverse data sets. Uh, Joy Bulamini, who's done a lot of work in this area, she um, and, and a, a researcher from Microsoft created um, pilot Parliament's benchmark uh, data set. Um, you have to request it, but I highly recommend using that um, to test your model accuracy because we're all trying to build um, the most accurate models we can, right? Um, so that's my elevator spe speech, I guess, <laughs> in summary. Any questions on that or are we good? Okay. Uh, you. Your opinion about uh, Keras oh. versus uh, PyTorch. Oh, Keras? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I didn't mention Keras, um, <clears throat> but Keras does um, make TensorFlow so much easier to use. And I, I've definitely used it. I don't use TensorFlow anymore uh, <laughs> without using Keras, for sure. So um, th that's why I kind of, you know, focused a little bit more on some of the, um, the other areas where they diverge versus just the ease of, ease of use, you know. Um, but yeah, Keras definitely makes TensorFlow a lot a lot easier to use. TensorFlow definitely relies on the community um, to build things. They, they did the bare bones themselves and, and it's been up to the community to make it easier to use or as I said, you know, to use um, with dynamic uh, batching like TensorFlow Fold. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Alrighty. Thank you again so much.